we started a series on the word for the year. And for those of you that may be new, you don't, you may not know this, but this has been happening in my life, personally in my life for years, where I start about October, November, I really do, and I start praying and seeking God. God, what is it something you want to teach me? What's a word? What's a verse? What's a book of the Bible? What is something you want me to focus on in the coming year? Or what is something you know I'm going to need in the coming year? I'm going to need to know a certain truth in the coming year because I don't know what I'm going to face in that whole year. So what is a word? So I started this years and years ago just for me, and it has, it has grown into, God, what do you want for my people? If I'm their shepherd, what is it that you want me to share with them that they need to know that you're imploring them, you're compelling them, or you're just preparing them? What is it? And so we do uh, that, and, and throughout, a lot of times I've had God give me, not give me the word, and I'm praying about this, and and thinking about it and fasting about it throughout October, November, December. And there's been times that, you know, I guess he's right on time. He's never late. But by December 31st, he found, I remember in 2000, we were in a, work, we were in a New Year's Eve service in, in the year uh, uh, 2000. And uh, at the first church, my dad was pastoring there at the time. And it was the closing prayer, New Year's Eve. And I'm standing there going, Lord, I don't understand. I don't understand. You, you, I've, two months I've been praying. You haven't given me anything yet. And, and when in that closing prayer, he spoke a word into me. He said, this year will be a change in your life, in your wife, and in your place of ministry. And I got in the car, and it was 99 going into 2000. Sorry about that. Stand corrected. Missed it by a year. Who knows? Okay. But, but um, so... That year, that was December 31st, by the middle of January, her dad came to us, to see us, didn't, didn't tell us why, sat down and wanted to talk to me about a job. And as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest is history. Because I left where I was, went, new place, new ministry. We were expecting Tatabug later that year, okay? And... All that changing. God gave me a word. And every year he's done that, <clears throat> even if it's what I thought was late. But he gave me a word this year, and here's the series that we're doing right now on this word. And the word for the year is awaken. Awaken. And as I introduced that word last week, I shared uh, four characteristics that lead to a spiritual awakening in our hearts and lives. How many of you know that our community and our country needs a spiritual awakening? Now, oftentimes, and I'm not even going to give this to you uh, in, in detail. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research, and I'm only trying to keep this within about four or five week series. But I've got enough notes compiled, I could probably go to a Easter on it. Uh, but, but I can tell you that any time people, and I need you to understand this, we all say, oh, Lord, we need a spiritual awakening. But what we don't realize a lot of times is a lot of times a spiritual awakening doesn't happen until there's a tragedy. The last time this country saw a major increase in church attendance was when? 9-11. That's 22 years. 9-11 was the last time Churches in America saw a dramatic increase in attendance. So a lot of times when there is a spiritual awakening, it happens out of the ashes of catastrophe. Lord, we want a spiritual awakening if there's any other way but that. But if there's no other way but that, then God awaken people's hearts and souls. Amen? And so last week I introduced to you four characteristics. And so... I want to take this morning and take a little deeper look into those characteristics. Now, I'm going to hit the whole idea of awakening from different perspectives. Um, uh, like I started to tell you, uh, some of the notes I've got show historically, all the way back to Jesus' day, you can see historically about every hundred years, there is something that happens in the world. 
good, bad, indifferent, or ugly, that happens in the world that leads to a spiritual awakening. And, um, and so I want to dive into a little bit of this without giving you all of that. And, uh, but, but just briefly, uh, let, me, let me summarize the context um, of these characteristics. I want to, I want to help you understand uh, the context to connect the why of this word. Why is it this word? Why is awakening the word for the year? I want to connect for you the why of that word to how important it is for each one of us, not just as a church body, but for each person in the room. I started my conversation with you last week saying this, in order to continue to be vital and productive and healthy, individuals, communities, businesses, and churches must be willing to honestly determine if they're in one of three places, a place of stagnation, a place of decline, or a place of renewal. You got to wonder, you got to look in the mirror and go, is my personal spiritual walk with God stagnant right now? It just seems blah. It just seems like nothing. Is my <clears throat> spiritual condition in decline right now? Well, how do you know, Pastor Mark, if it's in decline? Well, one of the things is the devil's never far from the door. And if your life is in spiritual decline, what that means is you've stopped doing the spiritual things that keep you healthy and you've gone back to doing fleshly things that put you in bondage. You started shifting backwards to things of your old life. That's how you know if your life and heart is in a place of decline. That's how churches know if they're in decline. You know, when a church, when a church, any church, I don't care what church it is, when a church of 10 or a church of 10,000 spends a year without a spiritual shepherd leading them, they don't realize they're in a place of decline and death. Because the church body is not meant to lead itself. God equipped shepherds to lead sheep into spiritual renewal, into spiritual growth. My, my grandfather and other farmers that I've known of, when, when they did cattle, when they did cows or if they did sheep or whatever they did, they would, have, they would have multiple pastures. If they had a lot of them, more than just one or two, you know, if they had a lot of them, they would have a pasture land over here and it would have a hot wire fence between them. And they would leave them over here for the summer. But then at some point in that year, they would open up the gate and they would move them over here to this pasture. You know why? Because they had eaten everything in that pasture and that pasture was in need of renewal. It needed to be redeveloped. It needed time to grow grass again. So they would move them over to another pasture that already had grass in it and where they could, they could, the cow could be renewed. It's no different than our lives. You sitting in the same position in your spiritual walk day in and day out, you're starving and don't know it. And so in order to be vital, in order to continue to be productive in your life, in order to continue to be healthy spiritually in your life as an individual and as a church, there are things we have to do. Jesus spoke about this, and I want to read it for you. I want you to do me a favor, and, and, and don't let me be spitting in the wind here, okay? Uh, let's make a pledge together that in 2023, however many people today brought their Bibles, uh, not just on your phone. The phone is okay. I'd rather you have your hands on the Bible because the phone represents too much distraction, are you with me? I'm going to preach multiple sermons today. Is that okay? Um, the phone represents multiple distraction. And most of you are so worried about missing something, Mama Lucy. Okay? I always call Tracy that because she said Mama Lucy always wanted to know, her, wanted to stay around until she heard what was going on, you know. What, what, who's driving that vehicle? She told me the story of Doris and her going uptown one day and, 
and she was a little girl in the back seat of the car, and Mama Lucy was in the front. There was a van sitting next to them, and, and, and Mama Lucy whispered out loud, she goes, I hope Doris don't come back till I find out who's driving that van. So <laughs> she didn't want Grandma Doris to get back in the car until she figured out who was there. Now, see, some of you have that same mentality. You're afraid you're going to miss something. So you never turn off your notifications on your phone. That's why I'm just preaching about the phone for a second. I'd rather you have the Word of God in your hands than to scroll your phone and trying to read the Bible and then all of a sudden breaking news pops up or a notification from somebody pops up. Now you're off doing something else. So here's what I want us to pledge to each other. Can we pledge that you bring your Bible more this year than you actually did last year? So some of you, if you didn't bring it at all last year, <gasps> then if you bring it one time, you've made a 100% improvement in your life. <laughs> right? You've already made a 100% improvement if you bring it once. And if you bring it more than once, man, you're just on top of the world of success. Right? So let's bring our Bibles. I want us to be able to flip the pages together. I want us to be able to experience it and read it together. Enough of that sermon. Let's go on to the one I'm in. So Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9 in verse 14. So Jesus is getting to know his disciples. He's done some, some miracles. He's, he's, he's getting, uh, his, uh, connecting with some of them. Matter of fact, right before this conversation, he's just introduced himself to Matthew. And Matthew has just started becoming one of his disciples, according to the text. And so it's all new and fresh. Remember now, they're new to this man, Jesus. They know he's not like the other Pharisees. You remember what we saw last Wednesday night when we watched the first opening session and Jesus was doing the Sermon on the Mount and as people left the Sermon on the Mount, it's actually in the text, they were walking away and they were saying, who is this man who teaches with such authority? And what they were saying is we've got Pharisees and religious leaders and we've got teachers of the law who they know God's law, but man, they don't teach it with the authority that comes out of this man. This man stirs our hearts. It led to an awakening in those disciples and people. And so that's what's going on. So they don't know this man too well. They're still getting to know him. He's new to them. That's key. That's the key context. You need to understand that as I, tell, as I read you his conversation. He knows that these disciples are new to him. They don't know what to expect from him. And he starts laying down some teaching with this. And so right here in verse 14, then John's disciples, you remember John the Baptist? Then John's disciples came and asked Jesus, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is still with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast. Listen. No one sews a patch of unshrunk clothing on an old garment. For the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst and the wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine <coughs> into new wineskins and both are preserved. Listen to me. The central focus of this passage, in other words, the main point that we are supposed to take away from what Jesus has said is simply this. There are fresh, new things God wants to do in our lives. And in order for God to do these things, we have to be teachable. Now, understand something. <clears throat> John's disciples come to Jesus. They're representing an old way of doing things. 
And it's interesting that they list an even older way. And so he says this, why is it that we and the Pharisees fast and yours don't? And Jesus understands that comment, and he's basically saying that's an old way of doing things. God wants to do something new and fresh and different. And then he gives them an example that they will understand. <clears throat> They'll understand because a lot of those folks lived back in the poor days. Remember, you remember? Now, a lot of these kids today don't know a lot about this. They may not know. They may know more about what a rotary phone is than they'll know what I'm about to say. But how many of you remember hand-me-downs? Yeah? And if, if, if like Tommy Ann, I think you're the baby, and my daddy was the baby of eight, and so, you know, Gene, by the time that new pair of shoes started with the oldest kid and got down to you, it might just be shoelaces and a sole. You know, there might not be a whole lot there. By the time those pants, you know the pants that they wear today, don't it blow your mind? The pants that these girls wear today, these guys wear today, they go, bam, $80 for shred holy pants. How st 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 stupid. We made them that way. Right? If you got a pair brand new for Christmas, they were scratchy and, and they, were, they, were, uh, they were stiff. And it wasn't until you had a few tears and holes in them that they were comfortable pants then, weren't they? But now if you're the eighth child to get that pair of pants, might be a little too drafty. Right? We were in, in Highway 55 recently, and sure enough, I've seen all the little tears. But this girl walks in, <clears throat> no lie, y'all, when she walked in, I thought, you cannot be serious that she spent money on that. She walks in and is walking right past, and from here, you can see the pocket. From here to there, below her knee, there won't nothing but skin. And there's pants down the back that hook back. They had to be half price. Because it won't but half pants. I don't get it. But Jesus, they got it. They all were poor folk. They all had holy stuff. They all tried to make things. They repurposed it, we call it today. They'd take those old, old jeans and they would, they would uh, fix them. They would... They would try to patch them up, but they knew what Jesus was saying, that if you try to patch it up with a new pad, new piece of clothing that has not shrunk, in other words, it's not been worked, it's not been worn out. How many of you remember this? Worst thing ever invented in my life. My mama did them for me. The iron on patches, Jesus, help us. Then we're straight from hell. Because you'd put it on the knee where the knee was torn, and all of a sudden, you know, I could walk to school, and she'd give me that patch, that iron on patch, and I'm walking like this, you know, because you can't bend your knee to things too hard. Scratch your knee right off. Anybody remember them? That's what he, Jesus said. You couldn't take a piece of cloth that was brand new and sew it into this. And then he would say, you can't take new wine and old wineskins. And here's what you don't, may not understand because we don't use wineskins. And, uh, and, and, and you remember the Westerns? Before they had the tin cans, they'd have the bags of water, and they're made of deer skin or they're made of, of buffalo or whatever they're made of. The point is, anything made of a hide, anything made like that, when the liquid comes out of it, it dries it up, it brittles it up, it makes it inflexible, it makes it unable to be used. And so if you take one of those shriveled up wine skins and try to pour new wine into it, one, it's going to run over the side, but two, if it does get inside of it, that new wine will expand. You ever put, um, you know, that? You, does anybody know why you have fruit in fruit containers with holes in it? Why does the container have holes in it? Because if you put it in a sealed container, the fruit puts off as it's, as it's ripening and rotting, if you leave it in your refrigerator long enough. If you want to find out what ripened fruit looks like rotted, come look at our refrigerator in the church and see what Jordan and Jonathan leave in there for a month at the time you will find experiments happening in that refrigerator in there. 
Something that looked like an apple now has new life. It's something else, and we don't know what. But the truth is, because the gases and the things that happen with that fruit, you don't put it in a sealed container. Same thing with the wine. You pour new wine in there. As that stuff, it expands and expands and expands. And at some point, that old wine skin is going to crack open. It's going to split. In other words, Jesus is telling them, if you stay like that hard core wine skin, then the new thing that God wants to do in you won't happen. It won't happen. You will resist it to the point that you would rather be without it than be changed by it. And that new wine will go away. And why is that important? Why is it important for the Holy Spirit for you to be pliable, for you to be teachable to what God's Word through the Holy Spirit wants to teach you and tell you. How pliable are you right now in the season of life you're in? Whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, how pliable, how flexible, how submissive, how teachable are you to the Holy Spirit, to God's Word, to the things that He may have been whispering to you, the things that He wants to teach you and tell you, the things that he wants to change in your life. The things that you've been praying about God changing in your life and yet haven't changed. How pliable are you awake to what the Holy Spirit's been whispering and teaching you? You see, I told you this last week, the first step to any renewal is an awakening to the truth. The truth of our condition. The truth of where I am in my walk with Him. We must be honest with ourselves about that. And these characteristics that we've talked about, are going to talk about can truly help us do, and it will help us do that. It will help us be pliable. These characteristics, if you apply them in the next 21 days and for for, for 2023, I'm telling you right now, you will not recognize your life in a year. I just believe that. I don't mean you'll all of a sudden be a movie star and glamour shots. And all that. I mean things within you will have changed so much that what used to be important will not no longer be important. And things that you used to be beaten by, you will no longer be beaten by. And so these things, these characteristics can truly help us do that. And they can truly help uh, lead us to an awakening of new life, of deeper life, of healed life in Jesus. I just believe it. The first one is this, and they're in order for a reason. They're in this order because it's progressive. The first one is prayer. Here's what prayer represents. If you want a little phrase about how important prayer is, why you should pray, why more people should should not just do uh, the, the rock skipping prayers, you know, bedtime, morning time, lunch time, dinner time why you should be talking to God and praying more is because prayer is a place of presence. It's not a duty. It's not a thing you do. It's a place of presence. As much as the Heavenly Father wants to bring some some fresh and new things into your life, listen to me now. I want you to get this. As much as God wants to do some things in your life, as much as he wants to bring some new things into your life, you need to understand something. God is not a forcer. He's a filler. He will not force his new wine into you. By the way, I'll tell it to you a little bit later, but let me go ahead and tell you. In the New Testament, wine is symbolic of something. God, Jesus is using that phrase not to get people to drink wine. He's using that phrase because he understands the, the, the process of wine and the newness of it and all that thing. Wine was symbolic of the Spirit of God. It was symbolic of the Holy Spirit. It was new and fresh. I'm not talking about the old wine. I'm not talking about the fermented wine. I'm not talking about the alcoholic wine. There's two types of wine in the Scriptures. I'm talking about the new wine. The new wine was sweet and fresh and good to the body. And so the new wine represents the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures. And so Jesus is really using that 
that symbol there to say, hey, here's what I'm talking about. And so prayer represents that place of presence where God's Spirit can fill you. He will not force. In other words, I have to want and I have to be willing, willingly making room for His presence and what He wants to do in my life. 21 days of prayer and fasting is what I'm calling you to do that with. It's to make room, be willing, and want to see God do something in your life and in the life of your loved ones. But you got to make room for His presence. Prayer has a way of creating room for His presence. And when the focus of our prayers, I want to kind of guide you in, in, in how to pray. Because if the focus of your prayers is only your own relief and your own happiness, then we're not really making room for His will and His glory to shine in us. We're just treating Him like Walmart. We're just going to Him because we want something. Nobody goes to Walmart to hang out and socialize and, and eat dinner. and You only go to Walmart because you want or need something. You don't go for anything else. And a lot of times we treat God like Walmart. We just go to Him when we want or need something. And the truth is, if the focus of your prayer time is to just tell God everything you want or need, you're not making room for Him, for His will, and for His glory to shine in your life. The motive for prayer has to be the presence of God first and foremost. The second trait that I want to give you is fasting. If prayer is a place of presence, then fasting is a stirring of passion. Fasting is more than just abstaining from something, folks. Fasting involves sacrificial thinking and action. Fasting should result in more than just answered prayers. It should really result in a maximum spiritual fullness of God. In other words, you should be more full and more sensitive and more, more present with God after your fasting than you did before. It should not be just about answering prayers. It's about a maximum fullness. Fasting, another thing to remember about fasting is that obedience to fasting measures something. It measures the level of commitment and passion for God's presence in us. If you decide to fast and then every few hours you're breaking your fast, that's not obedience. And whatever level of obedience you're committing to actually is measuring the level of desire you have for God's presence and passion in your life. So if you're breaking your fast constantly, that's a low measurement that you are even concerned to have God's presence or power in your life. But if you're sticking to it in every way that you possibly can, whatever God leads you and teaches you about fasting, let me tell you something else about fasting. Fasting is not about miracles or breakthroughs. Those do happen. Jesus told his disciples that there are some things that only come by prayer and fasting. They were talking about a demon-possessed boy that they tried to cast the demon out and couldn't do it. And they went to Jesus and they said, why is it that you just spoke and it was cast out, but we couldn't do it and we prayed and gathered around did everything in the world. And he just simply said, because some of these things happen because of the maximum fullness of the presence and power of God working through you because of your maximum obedience to surrender your life in prayer and fasting. Otherwise, you're just dinner guests showing up to eat and leave. You're not anybody who made who cooked the meal. You're not anybody who was there working for it. You just want to come in, let God bless you, and go out about your business. He goes, and some of those battles that you get into don't bring the result you want because you're not willing to sacrifice. You're not willing to have sacrificial thinking. Nope. In truth, fasting is not about miracles or breakthroughs, but it is about shutting down our natural man. 
so that our spiritual man can rise up and be stronger, so that our spiritual man can have an awakening. That's an awakening. Let me read you. I want to, it's, it's a little bit long, but boy, does it describe some things. I want to read you a quote uh, from, from a book I read a couple years ago. I went looking for this quote again because I had read this book and I remembered this quote. And I want to read you this quote about why it's important for prayer and fasting to bring an awakening in your life, to bring an awakening in our church, to bring an awakening to renewal in this, in this community. And listen to what, listen to this fast. I'm gonna, I'm, it's going to take a little few minutes, but it, it, just, just listen to it. The constant demands on our mind, the distractions, and the noise can weigh us down and put us in a spiritual fog. Life has a way of stacking on the pressure and the pain which causes our emotions to get out of whack. And as we get tired and weighed down, our conscience can become unsensitive, desensitized, not really bothered by the things that once convicted us. God's voice is slowly muffled out, and we begin to lose our passion for him. The fire within dims, and we shift into spiritual autopilot, operating from a position of obligation or routine in our relationship with God. Instead of one of affection and fervor and passion, even if we're going to church, reading our Bible, worshiping, there are times when we need to give our souls a good spring cleaning to make them fresh again. We've got to get the gunk out of God's temple so we can hear his voice clearly and prepare ourselves for the new things he wants to do in us and through us. This is what fasting does. It's the secret key to never being lacking in your zeal, but keeping your spiritual fervor for serving the Lord. Fasting gives us a new wineskin and gets the fire back in our relationship with Him. Listen, <clears throat> what you're going to see, and I'm going to try to hurry, but what you're going to see Starting today, and you'll see it every day for the next 21 days. If you go to go to our social media stuff, I, I was in a I was in a conference yesterday with a bunch of pastors as we launched our 21 days of prayer and fasting across this across our denomination, across other churches. And while sitting there in a time of prayer and reflection, they gave us time to go off and sit and journal and write. God began to give me some things, and so. I haven't even given it all to Jordan yet, but you, you'll see it starting today and every day for the next 21 days. I don't, I'm not a social media guru. Y'all know that. Y'all know I don't care for it. But I'm still going to tell you this. If you go to our stuff this afternoon and starting tomorrow, you're going to see 21 days of prayer and fasting daily word. And God gave me these yesterday. And for the next 21 days, you'll see this listed under that heading. You'll see this listed. God is blank. God is blank. Today's word is faithful. God is faithful. And here's what I want you to do with that. I want you to take the word of the day off of our Pikeful Church stuff. Take whatever the word is, and I want you to think of ways. Take some moments right there. Make room. Create the place for the presence of prayer of God. And begin to think, find, Google it if you have to. You can Google every one of these. Google scriptures, if you don't already know them off the top of your head. Scriptures about God's faithfulness. And then just pick three. I didn't want to assign them to you because I know the Holy Spirit can do things new and giving you the scripture he needs you to have for that day. So I didn't want to give them to you. Because what I have may be just for me. But if you look up, what are the three scriptures for the day that deal with fasting? Look up three. Not one, look up three at least. Look up more. And you read those three scriptures about God's faithfulness today. And then you thank him. Step two, 
you thank him for his faithfulness. You pray for nothing else but the word of the day. You pray, God, I just want to thank you. I'm not here to ask you for anything. I'm not here to complain to you about anything. I'm here to just thank you for your faithfulness. Pray the scriptures that you found. Whatever scriptures you read about the faithfulness, just pray them. Pray those scriptures. And then the third thing you do, somewhere, I hope you won't be lazy. I hope you'll do this because it comes back to serve you later. Somewhere on a sticky note or in a journal, write down two or three ways that you know of God's faithfulness today. Tomorrow you'll have a new word. It'll be up sometime before lunch, and you'll have a new word. And you go to the stuff, and you look it up, and then you Google two or three scriptures to read about that word. And for every day, for the next 21 days, there will be a word, a daily word for your prayer and fasting. Why? Because what I'm trying to get you to do after that quote I just read you, all of us fit that quote, don't we? Sometimes we just come to church out of routine or obligation, and we just stand here and wait for the singing to be done, and we've missed the glorious opportunity to do what the angels are doing in heaven. We've missed the glorious opportunity to do what our loved ones who are going on ahead of us are doing in heaven and have prayed for us. We missed the glorious opportunity of being amongst the family of God, worshiping and honoring and praising Him. Why? Because we just stand here and let the words bounce off the wall and we don't care to sing it. We don't care to raise our hands. We don't care to worship. We're just here waiting for the day. That's routine. That's routine. That's obligation. Fasting can help change that. Here's a third word. Third characteristic. And we'll run through these last two ones. Third characteristic is surrender. Because surrender is an act of purpose. If prayer, if fasting stirs our passions, you know why it stirs your passions? Because when you start surrendering those things, when you start uh, doing without, listen, I knew the fast was going to start today. And, and yesterday, can I just tell you, my flesh was already throwing a temper tantrum in the aisle at Walmart. How many of you know there's still a child in you? And in my, my flesh, this is, this is, this is, I don't, I'm not going to give the devil credit. This is my flesh. You ready? Riding back yourself. You know that fast starts tomorrow. You know y'all cooking at home tomorrow. You know you can't have any tea with that tomorrow. Fruit syrup, man. I feel my flesh. You know you can't have any coffee for the next. Fish. I literally pictured me as a five-year-old. In the in the in the hall in the in the aisle at Walmart, just kicking and screaming. I don't want to fast. I don't want to do that. I don't want anybody's flesh. Know what I'm talking about? You, some of you don't even fast, and your flesh throws a fit every chance you get. See, fasting stirs your passion because when you realize you're doing without something, you got to fill it with something. And the purpose of the fast is to fill it with more of the presence of God. Can I just tell you what happens? It shifts. You see, I've already done this. Three weeks ago, I started my fast preparing myself. Had to get myself disciplined a little bit. And so I took a week, about three weeks ago. And I mean, it was ugly temper tantrums, Eddie. I was ugly little boy. If your grandmama had seen me in the aisle, she'd have beat me senseless that day. My flesh was ugly. I didn't want to go out and eat. I got to drink water. I didn't want to go do this. I got, got to drink water. I'm just not going to eat. Today. I got to drink water. Can I tell you two things that began to happen during that fast? I began to crave water. Come on. My body began to crave more water. All of a sudden, I'm sitting at a restaurant now, and it don't even cross my mind to want to order this. I just want water. Come on now. For those of you who are thirsty, come after me, and I'll give you water that, that will never go. You'll never thirst again. I began to crave water. You know what else began to happen? I began to sense in the moment God's presence. I'm sitting in a restaurant. My family don't even know it. And I've ordered water. And suddenly I just sense in 
deep within, I'm going, thank you, God. Just to sense you, thank you. And all the distraction and all the routine, thank you. You know why? Because surrender is an act of intentional purpose. You intentionally lay it down. And you surrender. Fourth and final characteristic is repentance. And remember, the word repent is an action word. It means to change direction. Repentance is not asking God to forgive you every day. Repentance is showing that you know God has forgiven you by the fact that you're changing the way. You live, you work, you walk. Do you know why sin is so powerful in our lives? You ever wondered why sin? It's the devil. No, 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 no. I don't think the devil has to tempt you every single day. This is just Mark talking. I don't think the devil has to tempt you every day. Your flesh has memory. It remembers. It can tempt itself. The devil could be off busy with Gene today. And I just tempt myself. The reason why sin is so powerful in our lives is because it's an experience. Come on now, I'm closing. We don't learn about sin, we experience sin. I'll give you an example. If you live, especially if you're, anybody can do this, but especially if you're older, it's richer to you. If an old song from back in the day comes on the radio, immediately your heart and mind is flooded with memories, with fun, with good thoughts, maybe not all good thoughts, maybe there's some songs you don't want to remember, but you know, if there's an old song that comes on, or there's an old movie. Listen, all these youngsters who went and saw Top Gun, they thought it was a really good movie. A lot of them I talked to, and that was real, that was an awesome movie. But Eddie, ain't nobody can get Top Gun like all of us who grew up with it the first time, right? Then kids today can experience it, but nobody can really come out of that movie and go, holy mackerel, like we can, right, Gene? Back when you had a mullet, we were watching it back then. Yeah, you know? Why? Because we were in high school when that movie came out. We knew, right, Lee? And all of a sudden now we see the second one and it makes the first one the greatest thing ever because we grew up there. Why? Because it took us back to a memory that we experienced in life. That's why sin is so powerful. It takes you to an experience. Well, let me say this. The same principle can happen with God. You don't just learn about Him. These four characteristics of an awakening, these four characteristics I've shared with you this morning of an awakening. You see, for God to renew, for God to do something new and different in you, He's first got to get your attention. You first got to wake up to the truth that you need renewal. We're constantly in a state of decline or stagnation, so we constantly need renewal. God knows that. You ever wondered why the verse says His mercies are made new each and every morning? You know why? That's renewal. But before you can experience that new mercy, you have to awaken in the morning. You don't just learn about God, church. The last thing I ever want to do is for every one of you to die and go to heaven and, 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 and tell God that you were so grateful that, I, that, that they le you learned all about Him from what I taught you. That wouldn't be the greatest compliment to me. 
The greatest compliment to any shepherd and the greatest compliment to God is that you experienced Him. You experienced the move of His Spirit. You experienced the new wine of His Word speaking truth and and breaking bondages into your life. There isn't a person in bondage today who can't be delivered from it. But that's the work of the Spirit. That's what He does. You can't just learn about God. You have to experience Him. That's why Jesus came to heaven. Came to earth from heaven. Stand with me. These four characteristics, prayer, fasting, surrender, these things, all of these things, repentance, they bring an awakening into your heart and life. I remember being a teenager, growing up at the first church, and one Sunday night, and I, I was like any other teenager, I was doing the church thing, didn't necessarily mean I was serving God. And one Sunday night, a bunch of the teenagers had gone to Pizza Inn, their old setting. And they got into a God talk. And one of the teenagers made this comment. He said, I think we, you, should, you should strive every day to have as much of God and more of God, as much of God as you can get each and every day. And when they did, another teenager piped right up and said, uh, I think you can have too much of God. Listen. I might not have been living right at the time, but I knew right. And I knew that that statement was as far from truth as possible. You will never live long enough to ever have too much of God. If He gives you a thousand years on this earth, you'll never know enough about Him in a thousand years. So what that tells me is that even in the condition that I'm in, even in the healthy place that I might be today or you might be today in your walk with God, don't rest in that place. You will stagnate and you will decline as a church, as a community, as businesses, as people without an awakening and renewal. I I challenged our leaders today in our leadership meeting and all of our our service team meeting. Challenged every one of them. I'm challenging you. Please consider. Prayerfully seek the Lord about what He wants you to do. Please consider fasting in some form or way in the next 21 days. For an awakening in your life of a deeper walk with God, for an awakening in a friend or a family member who's unsaved and don't know God, for an awakening in our church to understand that we are living in the time that it's the easiest it can be to serve God. It will only get harder. And we need more people to know the light of the truth of the gospel of Christ. There should never be a day that you or I fail to invite somebody to God's house. There should never be a day. Honestly. You know why? Whether they come or not, there should never be a day that you fail to invite somebody to God's house. Because if you really believe God is all that He is, and you really believe He does all that He does, and you really believe He is who He said who you say He is to you, then you would want other people to know that and experience Him in any way. I'm asking you, if you've got medical conditions that require medicine to be taken with food, then you prayerfully plan that out. Even talk to your doctor about it. How can I fast with this medicine? Don't just blindly jump into it. I've been praying for two weeks, God, what do you want me to fast? What would be sacrificial thinking? What would be hard for me? It's I can fast broccoli for 60 days. I can fast broccoli. Not a problem. Now, I can fast liver. I can fast liver. I can I can fast liver for every day for the rest of my life. 
I can fast that. So God, what's, what's, what's going to be difficult? What's going what's to stir my passion? What's going to have my flesh throwing a temper tantrum? What do I need to fast? God, how do I need to fast? Because of your job, a job that you have that's tremendously demanding, you can't go nine hours without eating. So God, I'm going to fast one meal a day for 21 days, or I'm going to fast social media. I'm going to fast TV. I'm going to fast. Some of you might ought to fast cursing. You know? If that happens, that means i got to fast golfing too. God, what do I need to fast? What do you want me to fast? Do it in wisdom and figure out what he wants you to do. Remember, fasting is not just about going without something, but in that time frame, you're praying, you're reading your Bible, you're making notes of what God teaches you. I never considered journaling until I started fasting. And then I wanted to remember what God would tell me, and I would write it down in a journal, and I would go back and read it later, years later even, and see, wow, I forgot God did that in my life. I implore you, for your sake, for your friends and family's sake, for this church's sake, for our community's sake, will you seek an awakening with God in the next 21 days, starting today? Will you do that? Heavenly Father.